We need to go beyond a rigid CMIO identity. I can fully agree that immigration forms can still have this and so on. We still have to have four languages and, and all that. But the, the truth of the matter is, when you mentioned earlier that uh, is harmony enough and can we go towards cohesiveness, I think that's quite possible if you're talking about a static population, mm -hmm. that all of us who were born in a particular time and we began to live more harmoniously than after harmony, which is essentially coexistence, we begin to cohere more, which is actually a much more proactive way of, right. of becoming together. The, the cultural milieu or the, the way we look at things, uh, we basically look at things in terms of compartments. And, um, and by compartment, you know, it's all about organization. You can put your sock in one drawer and your underwear in another drawer. And basically, that's what we're doing with racial categories. We have put people into compartments. And really, uh, the idea of CIMO is basically that compartmentalization. And I think uh, moving forward, we should try to, you know, try to mix up the shelves a little bit, you know. We can put the underwear with the socks, um, maybe the un underwear is not, a, not the right yet. term, yeah. Man, the shirt <laughs> yeah. with the, the pants and stuff like that, right? Is the reality is really cultural diversity, right? We got this what I just say. The Chinese are not homogeneous, right? The incoming Chinese, the new Chinese don't like the existing Chinese. Now we look at the Indians, it's a whole nation, you know, many nations of them. And I grew up thinking that all oh, India must be speaking Tamil then. Until I went to the national survey and said, oh, India I speak Tamil. No, no, no. I'm Malayali. I said, Malayali? Malaya? Malay? You know, begin to understand that among Indians. There's so many. As I grew up, I went on to do humanitarian work in India. Goodness, the whole India actually is not. One India actually is composed of many nations. Right? And, and if we don't watch it, I think Malay will end up being the only homogeneous largest group, I think. I think we are more similar to New York than we are to, I guess, many of the other capital cities or countries within the ASEAN region, mm. where there's a, certainly a lot more homogeneity. But I also made the distinction that in New York, there is no CMIO identity, because you would say, I'm an Assyrian Jew, yep. or I'm actually a Bangladeshi from so-and-so. You, you define yourself through such small micro-ethnic groups yep. or other means so there, is no, there are no more four silos by yeah. which you define yourself. And as a result of that, the advantage is you define, everybody has to define themselves by their own small association. And that's usually a micro-ethnic group. Yeah. Yeah. But then what happens as a result of that is whether you're an Assyrian Jew or you're a Bangladeshi or you are recently migrating from Ukraine, usually everybody would say, what do you see as yourself besides being whatever, mm -hmm. mi whatever micro-ethnic association you have? And they'd say, I'm a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And if you ask them, what is a New Yorker? No New Yorker can define for you what it means to be a New Yorker. Yeah. Yeah. And really, we can't define it either, I think, because that's the whole huge attraction of New York and the excitement of New York. And yet, New Yorkers are very proud of being New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. So the question I have here is, can we aspire to a situation where we all feel uniquely Singaporean. We may not be able to define it through Singlish or durian mm -hmm. or chicken rice, but somehow there is that kind of cohesiveness that, that New Yorkers have between themselves. And, and you don't need to define it. And you don't need to define you don't need to. So, uh, The problem with Asia is that we tend to just like splurge a lot of money from the top to actually uh, sell a culture, whereas um, in the States and in the UK, it tends to be okay, you have like these guys who are doing something in the basement and then uh, it starts to uh, become hip-hop and um, this kind of new cultures, even a mashup of cultures. So you have like many different kind of um, categorization as a result. So uh, moving forward, uh, do you see uh, Singapore becoming more like um, from the roots up kind of um, mixed mash of culture? Something like what we have at the moment, like Peranakan, mm, the Peranakan mm, culture. Mm. Or would you see something like, you know, the government going like, okay, you know what, this is what I think is um, Peranakan culture, and that's it, full stop. Uh, just a great point. It just was in my mind before you said it as as uh, Kwon Ping as well. Talk about New York, right? Yeah, this we need to make a different differentiation between racialism and racism. 
And I think racialism is a, is a very top-down kind of, a, uh, like you said, a, a kind of a social engineering from the top on how uh, categories of race should be, uh, should be managed, right? So, and in that sense, it becomes artificial. Uh, racism, on the other hand, comes from, uh, from, from, from the apps and tides of, of how people live their lives, right? And so you have a, the, the common thing about both of these things is that you ascribe a certain uh, ethnic trait to something, like just now you talk about all the stereotypes. But what I, I want to say here is that uh, moving forward, we should not think about how we should social engineer uh, the way we live lives anymore. What we should be really lo looking at is like what you said, right? basically the attitude towards how we should treat others and i think that's that's the difference between cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism i still agree that we should move beyond cmio but in terms of abolishing it completely how i change my mind and i think i'm i'm uh, i'm actually exhibiting a behavior pattern i, I spoke about called uh, chinese privilege or the majority race privilege a majority race looks at an issue sometimes quite differently even as a liberal, than a member of a minority. So here we are, the majority race, the Chinese, and we say, we're all one happy people. Mm. So let's not talk about the need to have Malays and Indians and others. Let's just get rid of CMIO. And that's sort of a typical uh, majority race sort of liberal privilege. If you take CMIO out of the equation and say we're all one happy people, will it result in the minority communities' rights and status being eroded. But on the flip side, you say, how long are we going to continue with this crutch? You know, if we continue with this crutch, we will have to continue with policies like GRC, where you assume that if you don't have GRC, minority community candidates will not be elected. But there are a few fallacies there, Viswa, you don't mind me saying. The Chinese does not want to assimilate the Indians or the Malay, right? It is not in the Chinese psyche to assimilate other people. You just look at the minorities in China itself. It is not in the Chinese psyche. I don't think the Malays want to assimilate other people also. So when we say that, we must remember, get back to the 60s. Why do we say that you have the Malays, the Indians, the Chinese? It's because of the politics of race that's across the other side. But today, what the other side continue? do have the politics of race, we have gone far beyond. A long time ago, uh, we were all colorblind, at least my generation was. We, we grew up with friends of all races, some of which are still very close to me today. We were totally colorblind. It wasn't you were Chinese, you were Indian, you were Malay. Along the way came a shift in government policy. I always felt that Mother Thang drew a line in the sand. The more uh, we get foreigners coming in, I think for me, I feel the stronger urge to be called a Singaporean. And uh, as Mr. Ho pointed out just now, I think I have a closer cultural sense with a Malay than a Punjabi from India. I, I think Singapore at this moment is not quite ready to achieve, uh, to have a non-Chinese prime minister. And I think one of the reasons is because precisely because of the CMIO policy, which makes people tend to like their own kind. And that is entrenched in the schooling system. You know, when I was in school, I would get to know the people who were not Chinese, Malay, or Indian, only because I was the only one who didn't go for any of those classes. You know, while everyone would go to their respective Chinese classes, Malay sure. class, Indian, I would be sitting in the void deck with the others who go for German or French. And, and that's, ten, that's usually how one tends to make friends. Um, and I think as long as we have this policy, um, it's very difficult for Singaporeans to tend to vote for others outside of their own. There was a great blog written by a secondary school student about Chinese privilege. And it wasn't about racism. It was about how she felt, she was a young Indian student, and it was a very eloquent testimony about how mm -hmm. she felt marginalized. Mm -hmm. Little things like she'll be with all her friends, who are all Chinese, and they all break out speaking Chinese. Chinese. She's right there in front of them. She's a great friend of theirs, but they'll all break out speaking Chinese. And they don't mean it. They don't, they don't mean it. They yeah. just, it's, it's privilege. No, no, this one, I tell you, it's no privilege. It's simply you felt excluded, right? And we get excluded in all kinds of things. I get together, you start talking about vegetarian, I say. Sorry, I'm a meat lover. I feel excluded. So, vegetarian privilege. No, no. Rubbish, I, you know? No, no. Okay. <laughs> How do you relate to your friends? 
How do I relate do to you, when you When you interact with your friends, do you first look at them along and say, he's Chinese, he's Indian, he's Malay, or do you just look at them as friends? No, What's I your mean, optics? I mean, like, the way we got closer together was, like, through the, you know, our camps, like, beginning of the year, we have these orientations. Yeah. So, because of our, our life, right, when we are living together, we don't really see each other as Malay, Indian, or Chinese. We just see each other as, like, friends, you know, as just, like, friends. Yeah, so, it's not, like, you know, first, like, first impressions. Like, our cu our races are not, like, the our first impressions. Basically, like, about how we like each, about each other. It's not about, like, oh, this guy's Indian, so, you know, we don't like him. And it's, like, it's about your character. I'm a yeah. teacher. Yes. And I've always told Darwin that if he wishes to be a prime minister one day, he can be. So we really need to look at culture, not in a unidimensional manner, but it's a canvas. Okay? And if you look at a canvas, at a national level, if there's a national crisis, we find that we are pretty strong. SARS, GI, you know, right? You, you find that even when the transport breaks down, we don't stop pointing finger, we don't rush and say, hey, you, go back. We, we don't react racially. And that speaks a lot, you know? Yeah. I mean, other than you go to a hawker centre, people separate, reserve with some tissue paper and all that. But what I'm trying to say is that we need to be ready to be bold, take the risk, right? To say, how do we like you? Not, in, not tomorrow. And say, let's reduce it. Okay. Let's say we are Singaporean, but hey, who are, you, who are you? We see that actually cultures evolve over time. And when as cultures evolve over time, for example, the very idea of Malayness was not exactly the kind of Malayness that we see here today. The constitutional definition right, that a Malay must be a Muslim. You see this difference in Indonesia, for example, that a Malay don't have to be a Muslim. So what I'm trying to say here is that we need to have a sense of self-reflexivity in the way we practice, define ourselves, right? We, have, we need a sense of agency, but also a reflexivity think about how our we, we are in the world, right? And and once you realize that, you will see that you have some privileges, you may be victims in other ways, but then, then you see how to act in the world. And this is what I mean by trying to embrace a more uh, bottoms up approach. Like it or not, there's going to be a lot more diversity and a lot more multiple identities for each of us. Yeah. That can lead to a very fractious society, a very fractious diversity, or possibly to a more cohesive diversity. But we're not going to get to a more cohesive diversity except through a transitional phase of real messiness. The messiness that we see today as we all talk about these sort of things. So I guess my sense is that these types of discussions are extremely healthy. There's no conclusion you can draw, but this kind of messy cacophony of voices as we try to navigate towards multiple identities in an increasingly diverse world, I think eventually we will get to the sense of one Singapore.